On the 26th of January 2015, Jan Muffet went out for a drive after cleaning her house as she needed some fresh air. As she drove around the neighbourhood, she suddenly saw a turquoise pickup truck trying to catch up with her in her rearview mirror, and she instantly knew it was her husband, Tim Muffet. Jan then sped away and made a quick left turn to try and lose him, but as she got to the dead end of a cul-de-sac, Tim caught up with her and slammed into her SUV and then fired a gun, hitting her four times. Please help me! Yes, what address do you need help? I'm not on an address, I'm on a road on my road! You need to kill me! Come on, get a cop here now! Okay, what is, who's trying to kill you? My ex, my husband! He's trying okay. to kill me! Why had Jan's husband attacked her so suddenly and violently? And would Jan be okay and survive? Seventeen-year-old Jan Marie Caron first laid eyes on eighteen-year-old Timothy Oliver Muffet at Clackamas River in 1978, but her friends told her to stay away from him, as he was known to be a bit of a ladies' man. The following year, however, in January, the pair officially met whilst they were both working at a chainsaw manufacturing business in Milwaukee. Jan and Tim bonded over their love of the outdoors and their similar sense of humour, and by March of 1979, they were officially dating. Their relationship grew fast, and they were married a few months later, in July. A year later, in 1980, the couple's daughter, Kristen, was born, and they then had their son, Travis, two years later. In the early 1980s, the family of four lived in Oregon City, and here, Tim started a business with his father to help detect pipe leaks. Jan occasionally helped and worked at this business, where she answered phones and scheduled appointments. Tim was generous, devoted and determined, but alongside his good traits, he was also known to be very stubborn and controlling. The couple may have seemed to be happy from the outside, but behind closed doors, Tim's explosive temper was a major issue in their relationship, and he was a very dangerous man. From as early as the 1980s, Tim was violent with Jan. Jan recalled an incident around this time where Tim pulled a gun on her, and she said that during this incident, she stood up for herself, and with the gun pointed at her face, she told him, Go ahead, I can't stop you if that's what you want to do. Tim then told her that she was braver than he thought she was, and then after this incident, things were supposedly good for a while. But this good time did not last long, and their son Travis recalled how he often saw his mother and father fight, and other times, when his mother would slam doors and Tim would then chase her around the house. He said, They were always arguing over something, lots of stuff behind closed doors. Jan said that Tim pulled a gun on her again in 2006, threatening her so Jan hid in a closet. Tim told her that he could still shoot her through the wall and hit her if he really wanted to. She then mentioned another incident right before they moved to Canby, where Tim started beating her because he did not like something she had said. She begged Tim to stop, and it was only when she reminded him about her heart issue that he stopped. In 2011, Jan had been diagnosed with heart failure, and she needed a heart transplant. During the time where she was waiting for her new heart, Tim would tell her that she wouldn't get a new heart, and that she would die in surgery. Naturally, Jan got depressed around this time, but she got help, and tried to improve her mental health. But once the surgery came around, things supposedly turned around again, and loving Tim came out, and he nursed her through the long recovery, and stood by her, and once again, things got better for a while. But by 2012, Jan once again noticed a change in her husband. Tim was more critical, ridiculing what she wore, how she styled her hair, her choice of perfume, and was increasingly abusive to her, physically and verbally. Tim did not like his wife having male or female friends, or her being on Facebook, Tim's mental health took a turn for the worst, and depression overtook him. When Jan urged him to see a doctor, like she had, he told her not to worry, and that he would conquer his demons on his own. Over the next two years, he threatened to end his own life several times. He even suggested to Jan that they kill each other, and she would respond by telling him, not today. Through 2014, the violence continued, and one day, Tim pinned her to the floor during an argument, and she had trouble breathing. 
Three months later, he twisted her arm and knocked her to the ground during another dispute, but she still did not call the police. Up until now, she had never called the police as she loved her husband. She said, I loved him and forgave him for that and for a lot of things. Because you love somebody, sometimes you adapt to things you think are normal that really aren't. But finally, on the 18th of December 2014, during an incident when Tim had pinned her down, kicked her and knocked her over, she sustained a black eye and hit her elbow on the treadmill, so she finally called 911. Police arrested Tim on suspicion of fourth degree assault and harassment, and Jan went to the hospital alone and got x-rays. Whilst in hospital, she spoke to staff who advised her to get a restraining order. She said, I was told that if I stayed with Tim, that I was going to be a statistic. I always knew Tim was capable, but I didn't want to believe that the person I love would actually kill me. But despite these thoughts, this incident was the last straw for Jan, and she did get a restraining order against her husband. Their son, Travis, bailed his father out, and Tim went to live with him about a mile away from the family home. Jan said that this was one of the hardest things she'd ever done, and she cried when she thought of never speaking to her husband again, but she knew that she had to protect herself, as he inevitably would hurt her again. But the restraining order didn't stop Tim from reaching out to his wife by phone or through their son, but she refused to talk to him. Jan changed her phone and changed the locks of the home, and some nights, while she was home alone, she said she pressed furniture up against the doors in case Tim tried to burst in, but he never did. On the 25th of January 2015, Jan was moving forward with her life and she went for lunch with her son Travis. During their lunch together, Jan told her son that she was getting an attorney to divorce his father. When Travis went back to his home, where his father Tim was living with him, Tim drilled his son for information about Jan. Travis finally told his father what Jan had told him, that Jan wanted a divorce, and Tim responded by saying that this was not okay and that they were not getting a divorce. On the 26th of January 2015, Tim went to work early with his son Travis until about 10am. Tim later called Travis around midday and told his son that he was in a bad spot, and Travis responded by telling him that he needed to go and get help. Tim told Travis that he loved him and then hung up the phone. That same day, Jan was cleaning the house and getting ready to move as she had decided to look for a new place to live. She decided to take a break from the cleaning and headed over to Starbucks. Whilst driving home, Jan's phone rang and it was Tim. She picked up and they briefly spoke and during this phone call, Jan told Tim that she wanted a divorce and she then asked him not to call again. After she hung up, Tim called her twice, but she did not pick up again. Knowing that her conversation had most likely upset Tim, she started to worry that he would try and hurt her, so she drove to the church in Oregon City and started pacing around the parking lot for at least 20 minutes, and then she got back into her SUV and asked God to protect her, and then drove home. Back at the house, her nerves did not go away, and she decided to go back outside for a drive to help ease her stress and to clear her mind. As she was about half a mile away from her son's home, she saw a turquoise pickup truck behind her, which she immediately recognised as Tim's. Jan sped away and made a quick left turn to try and lose him, with Tim caught off guard by the sudden turn, he crashed through a wooden fence whilst trying to keep up. He then drove through the front yard and into the side of a home. Jan stopped her SUV and glanced in her rearview mirror and looked over her shoulder at Tim to make sure he was alright, but then she heard some gunshots. Jan immediately stepped on the gas and tried to drive away as she dialed 911. As she made the call, Tim managed to drive out of the yard and he started chasing her. What's the location of the emergency? Please help me! Yes, what address do you need help? I'm not on an address, I'm on a road on Myers Road! You I need to kill me! Which road are you on? Myers Road in Oregon City! Okay, do you have an address? Come listen, listen! Come on, Kathy Lee, come on, get a cop here now! Okay, what is, who's trying to kill you? My ex, my husband! He's trying okay. to kill me, pick a truck! Okay, what? Jan eventually turned right of Squire Road to avoid the nearby elementary school and she stopped at a dead end. Tim followed her, slamming into her SUV and he fired the gun again. 
This time, however, Tim hit Jan in the left side of her body four times. And does, what kind of gun does he have? Jan managed to crawl across the front seat of her car and she fled out of the passenger side door. She stumbled back down Squire Road for about a block and then turned onto Tony Court, a cul-de-sac neighbourhood. Luckily, at this exact moment, she saw a woman coming out of her home and Jan headed directly towards her. This neighbour caught sight of Jan and then immediately stepped into action and helped her. I've already got help coming. I need you to tell me why and what. I'm Glenn. I'm on Glenn. Squire. Just a minute. I'm walking. He shot me. Okay, you're on Squire at Glenn's you for? He shot me. Okay, where did he shoot you? In the chest. In the chest? He's over there. I can't breathe. Okay, hold okay, so, on just a moment. Courageously, the neighbour brought blood-soaked Jan through into her garage and immediately put pressure on her wounds. As they were scared that Tim was still outside and could come and find them, she closed the garage door to hide them and to keep them safe. Ma'am, we don't know where he is, correct, in the turquoise pickup? Correct. And she yes. just was walking and came to your house, correct? Correct. And you have, you don't know these people at all, right? She was just no. on the street and no. came to your house? No. Correct. Okay. I, I just no. came home and started went walking down the street. Okay. Okay. How is she doing? Okay. Like about how much blood would you say? A lot. I don't even know. The neighbor then stayed on the phone with an emergency dispatcher until police finally arrived. The police are out there. I can hear them. They're making sure it's safe. Okay. I'm checking with the radio dispatcher to see when it's okay for you to open the garage door, okay? My name's Andy. Okay. Yeah, I'm a detective with the City Police Department. Hi. We're going to help you, okay? I'm a heart transplant patient. Hey, she has a heart transplant. Hey, buddy, mom. Hi. I can't. Can you know, help your mom? Finally, police arrived and they kept Jan talking and kept pressure on her wounds as they loaded her into an ambulance and took her to the OHSU hospital. Meanwhile, Tim was found in his turquoise pickup truck with a self-inflicted gunshot wound and he was quickly taken to Legacy Emmanuel, another hospital five miles away from Jan. Jan was seriously injured. Bullets had hit her left arm, collarbone and lung and brushed one of her ears. But miraculously, after spending 12 days in hospital, she survived and recovered. Tim, on the other hand, had suffered a traumatic brain injury from the self-inflicted gunshot and he was put on a ventilator to keep him alive. Jan and Tim's children, Travis and Kristen, shuttled between the two Portland hospitals during this difficult time, being there for both their parents. After a search of Travis's home, where Tim had been staying at the time of the shooting, they found a three-page note from Tim on a desk. In this note, he said that he intended to end his life if he couldn't convince Jan to stay with him. He said that he loved her and that he was going to call her one last time to try and persuade her not to divorce him. The note said, I can't take any more hurt. I love you, Jan. I never cheated and I have tried to get through this. It's just too much. I know this is bad for the ones left behind, but I can't see a way forward. I am going to call you one last time. 
I know that this means I am violating the no-contact order, and if you tell them, they will come for me and put me in jail. I will not let this happen. To end my life is to at least stop my pain. I have physical and mental. I loved you, and you once loved me. I know. I don't know how you could have gotten to this point. I have been praying and trying to recover my faith that was lost. I was hoping to get back on track with our lives. I lost 35 pounds in hope to surprise you and make you love me again. I tried to understand how we got here, and I guess it must be my fault somehow. He wrote about the good times and how he was sorry he had failed her, saying, Jan, I will miss your sweet kisses, your beautiful face and the way you felt with me. When things were good, it was heaven, and I couldn't have been more complete when I was in your arm, and you in mine. I remember not long ago we made love, and you fell asleep in my arms. That was wonderful. I am going to take that thought with me as I go. I am sorry I failed you. He ended the note by saying that he was about to call her, and that if she still wanted a divorce, that this was the end for him. I'm going to call Jan now and see what her answer is. If it's no and she calls the cops, it's over for me. Goodbye to you all. Despite Jan's miraculous recovery, things were not looking good for Tim, and in the end, Jan herself had to make the most difficult decision. Doctors believed that Tim had no brain activity, so as his legal next of kin, the decision was down to her. Years ago, Jan and Tim decided that neither wanted a machine to keep them alive, and that Tim always wanted a quick death. So after speaking with her children and other family members, Jan made her decision. I had to pull the plug the next day, because I'm his wife. Even though we were people like we were separated, separation only because of a restraining order. We were not divorced. I am his widow. When the moment came, Travis held a phone up to Tim's ear, and Jan spoke to him from her hospital bed. She told Tim that she didn't understand why he attacked her, but he would always be the love of her life. And Jan said goodbye to her husband, as his life support was switched off, and Tim was pronounced dead at 6.50 p.m. Even when I was in pain and hurting, I made that phone call, but even though Tim was not there, I wanted to say goodbye to him. I told him I loved him, and that I would miss him, and that he would always be the love of my life, because he was. And in spite of my pain, I looked past that, and then I wanted them to unplug him and let him out of his pain. Jan and Tim's daughter, Kristen, told police that she hadn't spoken to her mother since her father was arrested, but that she had spoken to her father on the day before the shooting. He told her that he wanted to take care of her mother, even if they weren't together, and that he couldn't live without her. Kristen told police that her dad was probably clinically depressed, but was never diagnosed. Travis and Kristen knew their father had threatened ending his life, but neither thought he would actually go through with it. Jan said that she believes Tim's depression drove him to attack her, and said that despite what she had gone through and what he had done, that she still loved him, and that that night, he was a different man. Yes, he tried to, he tried to hurt me, he tried to kill me, but it wasn't that, that's not the man I married. To this day, Jan still wears two wedding rings on her right hand. One is a ring that Tim bought her for $600 when they were getting married, and the other is a ring he bought her in 2013 a show of faith that they would both renew efforts to fix their marriage. She said, I wear it because it's the last thing he bought me. It's a reminder to me that we were trying, but it didn't work. Jan says she still has nerve damage in her left arm that leaves a constant tingling from her elbow to her fingers. She said, I try to take it one day at a time. I still have memories of Tim because there are a lot of good ones, but I know that I have to let him go. There was times that he was wonderful i got two wonderful children that are a mix of both of us, and they have so many wonderful things about their father in them. I have pictures, I have memories of somebody that, I can't erase them. I always felt when Tim held me and put his arms around me, safe, safe. The abuse got to the point that it was time for me to realized for me to survive, I had to end it. 
At the end of the day, Jan knew she was in a dangerous relationship and she knew that she had to get out to save her life. Tim was blinded by love and he could not see the pain and danger he was putting his wife through. He obviously couldn't take accountability for why Jan wanted to leave him. And despite knowing and accepting that his mental health was at an all-time low, he didn't ask for help despite his family telling him to. He decided to fight his demons himself and this drove him to brutally attack his wife, the woman he said he loved, and then take his own life. I can't imagine the pain and suffering Travis and Kristen must have gone through to have both their parents clinging onto dear life and to then having to see their father slip away. I hope that they're both doing okay today and that Jan has managed to move on and that hopefully, somehow, she's got closure and managed to start a new path in her life.